Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to my library. If you're new here, hello, my name is Chinsia, and if you're not new here and you're one of my lovely regulars, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing splendidly. So today we are going down the road of Lilith, the much requested Lilith. There's, there was a lot for me to cover here, so I can only apologize. I've done, I've gathered information that I think would be most relevant, but there was a lot that I sifted through. So I hope you find the following fun. I don't know what, how else do you describe this? Fun. For nearly two millennia, Jewish rabbinic tradition has upheld detailed practices about death. Because the Jewish tradition believes that the dead will be resurrected in the Messianic era, burial preparations also focus on preparing the corpse for the anticipated event. If you could hear scratching, uh, my little puppy has a toilet roll and he's having a whale of a time. Obviously just the tube, not the whole toilet roll, just the empty tube. He went in the recycling bin. Anyway, that means from the time a person takes to their deathbed until the last clump of dirt covers a grave, there are Judaic systems of law designed to bring order to this dark and unpredictable period. Unlike other areas of the rabbinic law, the burial practices of today don't originate from a formal documentary guide. Whilst the rabbinic treatise has served as a primary text for funerary practices for 1,400 years, the Judaic customs of death were passed orally before then. In the 16th and the 17th centuries, the establishment of the societies called the Chevra Kadisha instigated the creation of a new body of text, which consolidated and preserved burial practices, as these societies were now in charge of preparing corpses. However, these texts did more than consolidate, as they also created new traditions by including Kabbalistic teachings, which complicated the spiritual significance surrounding the laws and rituals of the dying, including protecting the dying and deceased from evil and malevolent demons and creatures. According to their folklore, a dead body bereft of a soul could attract demons that had it within their power to possess the body and then make use of it. Which, yes, must sound very familiar, but strangely enough, vampires don't appear much in Jewish literature. This may be partly due to the passage of Leviticus that explicitly prohibits Jews from ingesting blood, stating, quote, the life of the flesh is in the blood. However, this isn't to say that there are no such things as vampires within Jewish literature. Can you see where we're going here? You see, one of the best known characters in Jewish folklore is the female demon Lilith. According to legends recorded in the Babylonian Talmud, Lilith was Adam's first wife. But in folklore, one of her roles is analogous to that of the succubus, the female monster who seduces men whilst they sleep, causing them to have seminal emissions. More frighteningly, she was also believed to attack newborn babies, particularly boys who had not yet received their circumcisions and girls who had not yet undergone their naming ceremonies, and also women who had just given birth. But before we get any further, I'd like to say a quick thank you because this video is sponsored by Squarespace. I have built all of my main business websites over the past few years with Squarespace because I loved how intuitive and easy that it makes website design and layout. You know, I don't know anything about coding, which is, <laughs> has made using other website platforms incredibly frustrating. But with Squarespace, I can drag and drop my content where I want and I love it. So if you're a creator who wants to expand your revenue stream, well, Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that makes it incredibly easy for you to monetize your content and expertise in a way that fits your brand. So first, Squarespace members area lets you sell your courses or classes to followers. And Squarespace also has an inbuilt email campaign option where you can collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers or just send them little wee updates and emails all from your website. And the inbuilt analytics feature gives you insight into who's visiting your site, you know, traffic sources, time spent on your site, most viewed content and more. 
So if you want to expand your business or just build a beautiful site for your blogging leisure, then visit squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch your gorgeous website, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So thank you Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. I will leave the link down below for your discount for Squarespace. And now let's carry on talking about Lilith. In his study, The Beauty of Medusa, Jerome J. McCann illustrates the complexity of Medusa as a, quote, key romantic iconograph. But he doesn't discuss another of the 19th century's popular beauties, the legendary Lilith. Her beauty is not Medusium because her horrors appear only after her seduction. But like Medusa, she is a variant of the romantic doppelganger, as she manifests the desires of those she seeks to control. To the romantic writers of the 19th century, Lilith represented a source of evil that destroyed those who came under her spell. Much like the sirens, men feared and loved her, but the only way to preserve humanity was to turn away from her enchanting allure. As McGillis writes, Lilith, like Cleopatra and Aphrodite, was an aesthetic temperament indicating the complex cultural changes taking place in the 19th century. The image of the virile woman disturbed faith in rationalism and the status quo. She was the manifestation of the psyche's fear of the inverted motherly figure, the loving wife, who instead sucked the vitality from the young men and children. But to understand Lilith's evolving image from a religious figure to a demonic vampire and then to an enchantress who was symbolic of women's suffrage, we need to go back to her ancient avatars. The Hebrew Lilith originates from the Sumerian Lilitu, also known as Adat Lili and Kiskil Lilike. The earliest mention of the she-demon dates from around 2400 BCE and is found in the Sumerian King's List. It states that the father of the hero Gilgamesh was a Lilu demon. The Lilu demon was one of four demons belonging to a vampire or incubi succubi class. The other three demons were Lilitu, Lilith, a she-demon, Ardat Lili, Lilith's handmaid, who visited men by night and bore them ghostly children, and Urdu Lily, who was likely her male counterpart, who used to visit women and impregnate them. Lilith's epithet was the beautiful maiden, but she was believed to be a harlot and a vampire, who, once she chose her lover, would never let him go, whilst also torturing him by never giving him any real satisfaction. Oh, my baby, what? Oh, cute. Why did you make that noise? How cute. Right, let's stop there. Someone just wanted to cuddle. So I'm getting kisses. I'm getting kisses. I love you so much. Anyway, where were we? Oh, that's right. Anyway, the Sumerian Lilith, or Lilithu, uh, was recorded as being barren and unable to produce milk. According to the Sumerian epic Gilgamesh, dating from around 2000 BCE, Lilith, or Lilake in this case, built her house in the Hulupu willow tree, which had been planted on the bank of the Euphrates in the days of creation. According to the story, a dragon set up its nest at the base of the tree and the zoo bird placed his children in its crown. Gilgamesh kills the dragon with a bronze axe, whereupon the zoo bird flees with his children to the mountain and Lilith, traumatised, tears down her house and runs to the desert. A Babylonian terracotta relief, believed to date to around the same time as the poem, has been argued by some scholars to depict Lilith as a beautiful nude woman with wings and owl's feet, and she adorns a cap on her head embellished with horns whilst holding a ring and rod. This relief doesn't depict a demon at all, but rather a goddess surrounded by wild animals she evidently tamed. Again, whilst this is a popular belief, the reading of the relief isn't set in stone, haha, ha, as there are some who argue that it depicts Ishtar and others that it depicts Ereshigal. 
At this point onwards, a Lilith image evolves. A tablet from the 7th century BCE found in the Arslan Tash of northern Syria shows her as a winged sphinx whose body features an inscription in Phoenician Canaanite dialect, which reads, O oh, flyer in the dark chamber, go away at once, O oh, Lilai, or Lilai. These lines were one of many incantation texts used to help women in childbirth from the period of the Assyrian Empire and the new Babylonian Kingdom. What's important about these is that they show that the myth of Lilith in the 8th century has all the major features that were employed 2,000 years later by Kabbalistic Judaism. So. If we want to find Lilith in the Bible, we have to go to Isaiah 34:14, which reads, The wild cat shall meet with the jackals, and the satyr shall cry with his fellows. Yea, Lilith shall repose there, and find her place of rest. This section that I just read is actually said by Isaiah when describing Yahweh's day of vengeance, and Lilith's inclusion in this prophecy suggests that Lilith was well known in the 8th century uh, Israel as a she-demon. Additionally, the day of vengeance supposedly uh, turns the land to a desolate wilderness, a desert, and describing this as Lilith's place of rest harks back to the Sumerian Gilgamesh extract of her running into the desert. The Lilith we know most about today comes from the nefarious stories that were written about her during the Talmudic period. However, in the 10th century, we get the alphabet of Ben Sirah, and this is the first time we hear of her being the first Eve. According to this version of her story, um, Adam and her were made of the same stuff, you know, dirt and all that, um, but they couldn't connect, and Lilith clearly just wasn't that into him. So when Adam asked to sleep with her, uh, Lilith asked, Why should I lie beneath you when I am your equal, since both of us were created from dust? Adam didn't like a woman who spat fags and was determined to overpower her. Lilith guessed his game and prepped herself. She spoke the magic words of God, rose into the air and flew away to the Red Sea, which was renowned to be full of demons and ill repute according to some men who were on Adam's side. Let's face it, most of us would rather go where Lilith was going than chill with insecure little Adam, who can't take no for an answer. It was there in the Red Sea that Lilith got her game on and lived her single life to his fullest, engaging in unbridled promiscuity with guys who clearly were intimidated by a woman with a brain and bore what the text referred to as a demonic brood of more than a hundred demons a day. Which doesn't sound great, in all honesty. I don't know how uh, she did as much as she did, you know, lovemaking wise, when she was actually giving birth to that many demons a day, but there you go. Interesting random fact, as we always go, according to early Talmudic tradition, demons and spirits were created so late on a Friday that there was no time to finish them before God rested on the seventh day, so demons remained without bodies which is why we can't see them. Funny, I like that detail. Anyway, God hadn't forgotten about Lilith, although she went to the Red Sea to do her little dandy doos, uh, so he sent three angels to her, Senoi, Sensenoi, and Semenjanov. God asked her, via the angels, to return to Adam, but Lilith was having the blast and she refused. Then they threatened with drowning her in the sea, to which she argued, let me be, for I was created in order to weaken the babies. If it is a male, I have the power over him from the moment of his birth until the eighth day of life. That was when he was circumcised and thus he was protected. And if a girl, until her twentieth day. The angels didn't take this answer so lightly, so Lilith had to make a deal with them, promising that whenever she saw the angel's name or their images on an amulet, she would not hurt the child associated with it. And she also said that the angels could kill a hundred of her children a day. Interesting. So everyone was happy. Until Lilith got the hots for Adam again, and R-worded him whilst he was sleeping. At this point, Adam had already been kicked out from the Garden of Eden, and was on his 130 year period of penitence, in which he fasted and refused to sleep with his wife, Eve. 
Unprotected, he and Eve couldn't control or avoid the nocturnal emissions of spirits and demons, which, yes, also impregnated Eve, and she, like Lith, bore innumerable demon children, which plagued mankind through endless procreation. So, who needs to do an ancestry DNA test now? Not me. Anyway, this is why, according to first century Rabbi Hanina, that men were forbidden to sleep alone in their house, lest Lilith gets them. The fear of succubae or incubi was so prevalent in the early 16th century that Abram Saba, a learned Kabbalist, issued a caution to those conducting a funeral, advising them to discourage a man's children from attending it. For if that man had had any intercourse, however slight, with a demon, his corpse would likely be attended by a crowd of these demon children who would claim to be his offspring, and these demon children would pull and torment at his body and injure his real children. I know, it's very dramatic. Additionally, Lilith was dangerous to women. Now, we're going to be talking about birth here, like things that happen with women and birth are not very nice details. So if you're sensitive to that topic, I'm just going to leave a little timestamp here. Please jump to that section. As I was saying, Lilith was dangerous to women. And let's quickly talk about some bowls whilst we're at it. Exciting, I know, but very important. Excavations conducted by the University of Pennsylvania brought to life several dozen bowls inscribed with magical texts directed against Lilith or Liliths. The bowls, dating circa 600 CE, were a hundred years older than the Babylonian Talmud, but historians believe that these incantations date back much further. According to the bowls, Lilith was clearly seen as a danger to women during periods of their sexual cycle, particularly when they were a virgin, during their menstruation, and an hour after childbirth. Lilies, or Lilin, could attach themselves to humans and cohabitate them. Being possessed by Lilies or Lilin uh, showcased itself through behaviours such as jealousy or an abuse and unkindness towards human offspring and partners. According to the text, Lilies could be responsible for miscarriages, complications during childbirth and infertility. The myth of Lilith as the child killer remained a potent factor in the lives of tradition-bound Jews down to the 19th century. To protect a newborn boy, child, against Lilith, they would draw a circle with natron or charcoal on the wall of the birth room and write into it, Adam and Eve, out Lilith. At the same time, they would write the names of the three angels. Now we've passed that bit, let's talk about Lilith and how she came to be. So there are two versions of Lilith's birth. One ties to the Talmudic Lilith, who was made of dust like Adam. However, this story slightly differs. You see, she was fashioned in the same way, but the story emphasises that whilst Adam was made of clean earth, Lilith, for unknown reasons, was made from filth and impure sediments. Another story suggests that Lilith wasn't made by God at all. Instead, she was a spontaneously occurring divine entity that birthed either from the great supernal abyss or the Din, which is known as the power of God, which manifested from the power of stern judgment. In the writings of the brothers Jacob and Isaiah, Lilith came from Din alongside Samael, born by the emanation from beneath the throne of glory in the shape of an androgynous double-faced being, corresponding in the spiritual realm to the birth of Adam and Eve, who too were born androgynously. Another version, which was also current in Kabbalistic circles in the Middle Ages, is silent as to Lilith's provenance, but makes her Samael's wife, the first among his four wives. According to Nathan Spira, who died in 1662, the marriage between Samael and Lilith was arranged by a blind dragon. But the marriage wasn't prosperous. Wary that they would fill the world with demonic offspring, God apparently castrated Samael and, according to 15th and 16th century Kabbalistic texts, made Lilith barren. But the former was why Lilith satisfied herself with other men elsewhere. Now let's go back to Adam for a second. According to another version of their story in the Zohar, Adam and Lilith became pregnant during their marriage. But because Adam wasn't a helpful partner, Lilith left him, attached herself to Cain, had multiple demon babies with him, and then returned to take revenge on Adam by R-wording him. 
The succubus image of Lilith, the woman who seduced and R-worded men and killed children, struck a chord with people and stuck. The romantics, who were fascinated by the exotic, perverse, sexual monstrosities and the occult, found Lilith an incredibly significant figure. Remember, the romantics and the writers that followed in the period, which were known as the decadent, uh, loved writing about the femme fatale, the effects of her cruel and diabolical beauty, seduction and the various other vices, and Lilith served as a perfect primer for the enigmatic female creature. The pre-Raphaelite Dante Rossetti was fascinated by Lilith. In his poem Eden Bower, he tells the tale of the fall of man as engineered by Lilith. In this version, Lilith was originally a serpent, reshaped by God into a human to form a bride for Adam. However, when she is rejected by Adam, she prays to the serpent, who was her first lover, to allow her to assume her serpent's form again so that she can tempt Eve with the apple. If this sounds slightly familiar, that's because Satan takes the form of a snake in Paradise Lost, though this is a quite an interesting take on the myth because there isn't a trace of metamorphosis from a snake in either Genesis or in the rabbinical tradition. In Paradise Lost, Milton compares Lilith to Sin. In Book 2, Sin, with her lover son, Death, guards the gates of Hell, and the description goes as such. Before the gates there sat on either side a formidable shape. The one seemed woman to the waist and fair, but ended foul in many a scaly fold. Voluminous and vast, a serpent armed with mortal sting. About her middle round a cry of hellhounds never ceasing barked with wide Serbian mouths full loud and rung. A hideous peal, yet when they list would creep if aught disturbed their noise into her womb. And kennel there, yet they still barked and howled within unseen, far less aboard than the vexed Scylla, bathing in the sea that parts the Calabria from the hoarse Trinacrian shore, nor uglier follow the night hag, when, cooled in secret, riding through the air she comes, lured with the smell of infant blood, to dance with Lapland witches, while the labouring moon eclipses at their charms. We can see in Milton's description of Lilith many familiar figures. He describes her as being half woman and half snake, which is the same description that many actually still ascribe to Medusa, such as in Ray Harryhausen's films. This also directly reflects Michelangelo's depiction of Lilith on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. The hellhounds around her waist are, as Milton stresses, directly inspired by Scylla, the nymph-turned-monster who was transformed by Circe into a horrifying sea creature, 12 feet in height, with six heads on long snaky necks, with triple rows of shark-like teeth and loins girdled with the heads of baying dogs. Milton's tone is rather comic, but MacDonald's Lilith figure is also plagued by her own evil, manifested in a dark spot on her side. George MacDonald's allegorical romance from 1895 called Lilith overtly makes Lilith a vampire, succubus, and witch. In the story, the protagonist, Mr. Vane, owns a library haunted by an old librarian called Mr. Raven, who worked for Mr. Vane's great-great-grandfather, Sir Upward Vane. The ghost, Mr. Raven, takes Mr. Vane to another world, where he meets Lilith, and the meeting goes as such. She was beautiful but with such pride at once and misery on her countenance that I could hardly believe what yet I saw. Up and down she walked, vainly endeavouring to lay hold of the mist and wrap it around her. The eyes and the beautiful face were dead, and on her left side was a dark spot, against which she would now and then press her hand as if to stifle a pain or sickness. Suddenly pressing both her hands on her heart, she fell to her the ground, and the mist rose from her and melted in the air. I ran to her, but she began to writhe in such a torture that I stood aghast. A moment more, and her legs, hurrying from her body, sped away. Serpents. From her shoulders fled her arms as in terror. Serpents also. Then something flew up from her like a bat, and when I looked again, she was gone. In the latter half of the book, Adam confronts Lilith by recalling the Talmudic story of her, and says, 
Lilith, when you came here on the way to your evil will, you little thought into whose hands you were delivering yourself. Mr. Vane, when God created me, not out of nothing, as say the universe, but out of his own endless glory, he brought me in angelic splendor to be my wife. And there she is. For her first thought was power. She counted it slavery to be one with me and bear children to him who gave her being. One child, indeed, she bore. Then, puffed up, with the fancy that she had created her, would have me fall down and worship her. Finding, however, that I would but love and honour, never obey and worship her, she poured out her blood to escape me, fled to the army of aliens, and soon had so ensnared the heart of the great shadow that he became her slave, wrought her will and made her queen of hell. How is it with her now? She best knows, but I know also vilest of God's creatures. She lives by the blood and lives and souls of men. She consumes and slays, but is powerless to destroy as to create. MacDonald's Lilith is pitiable rather than laughable. Yet despite the difference in sensibility, both Milton and MacDonald's Lilith's figures have death in the shape of a shadow as an accomplice, and her liaison with Satan also appears in both works. This trope of Lilith with Satan is seen again in Goethe's Faust, part one. When Lilith appears, the temptress frightens Mephistopheles, who warns Faust, beware of her hair, for she excels all women in the magic of her locks, and when she winds them round a young man's neck, she will not ever set him free again. Faust meets Lilith at what is possibly his lowest point, when he is completely given to sensuality, to give himself to her would be to accept damnation, and he quickly turns away. This same scene ends with Faust's vision of Margaret, a beautiful, innocent young woman with whom he falls madly in love with, but whom Mephistopheles deliberately confuses with Medusa. Victor Medusa stands in opposition to Lilith, who threatens man's virility. Medusa's beauty and honour work redemption. Lilith's beauty is a threat. Unlike Milton, who presents her as a hag, Goethe presents her as all the others do, as an alluring representation of destruction and degradation. But now let's return to MacDonald for a bit, because he has the most complicated relationship with Lilith as a literary figure. In 1872, MacDonald used Lilith in another novel, Wilfred Cumbermead. Lilith is actually the name of the protagonist's white mare, in an ironic reference to the book's dark lady, Clara Conningham. Clara is the Lilith of the story. Even from the age of 13, she is a seductive flirt, coy, sarcastic, patronising and unpredictable in her moods. Clara encourages the three main male characters in their love for her, and causes one to suicide, the ignominy of the other, and the success of the third, who happens to be the villain. But late in the book we learn that she has been an unwilling victim of her father's greed and lust for money and social power. Like the horse, Lilith, who is sold to the villain, Clara is the slave to a power that she detests. But suffering restores her dignity and independence of mind, and it turns out that she wasn't the Dark Lady at all, but a victim of a power controlling her. And that's how MacDonald saw Lilith. In March 1890, MacDonald reworked the book on Lilith, his romance book, for the final time, and in this version, he decided to make Lilith more powerful. Lilith is a victim who claims to have ensnared the heart of the great shadow so that he becomes her slave. However, she's the embodiment of primal sins, pride, self-love, envy, lust, anger and greed, all of which Vane falls victim to despite the many warnings. And like her traditional reputation, her beauty lures men to their fall. However, it's revealed that she's actually a chimera, a figment of men's imagination. She tells Mr. Vane, In me was every woman. I had power over the soul of every loving man, such as no woman ever had in dower. Could what no woman ever could or can. All women, I, the woman, still outran, outsawed, outsank, outrained in hall or bower. For by his side I lay, a bodiless thing. I breathed not, saw not, felt not only thought, and made him love me, with a hungering after he knew not what, if it was aught or 
but a nameless something that was wrought by him out of himself. For I did sing, a song that had no sound into his soul. I lay a heartless thing against his heart, giving him nothing where he gave me his whole, being to clothe me human every part, that I at last into his sense might dart, first into his living mind I stole. MacDonald manages to convey the idea that Lilith is a projection of Vane's own desires and creates a character that functions in her own right. In MacDonald's book, we see that Lilith encourages evil in others, but she herself suffers the torture of her own evil, symbolised by the dark spot on her side. Lilith symbolised everything that threatened the patriarchal world. She killed children, controlled men, and refused to lie with them as she did with Adam. Lilith was a forced slave of social convention, a beauty that is destroyed and also destructive. By the 19th century, more writers turned to presenting Lilith as a sympathetic character, which went hand in hand with the women's movement taking place at the time, and this culminated in her depiction within George Bernard Shaw's play, Back to Methuselah. In this play, Shaw transforms Lilith into a life force representative of the liberated mind, who created her own values, rather than following the status quo. Short's overt inversion of Lilith's demonic nature coincided with the women's suffrage movement, which had culminated just three years before his play. This shift in a masculine mindset and attitude towards Lilith, after centuries of demonic representation, demonstrated how the women's movement had really influenced how men viewed women, even within classical and ancient literature, and they were willing to transform and refute centuries-old depictions of them, despite the authoritative status that those depictions may have had as ancient or even religious texts. And thus concludes my video on Lilith. I hope it covered enough. I thought I'd do some literature, some ancient, all the things in between and what she is renowned for. If there are any other requests, please leave them down below if you want me to extrapolate on anything in more detail. Again, thank you to my lovely Patreons for making this possible and also for Sport Airspace for sponsoring today's video. And I'll see you soon for another Halloween-y video. We're going to the end of the year, basically. I'm going to go spooky until winter, February next year. Let's just keep going spooky, shall we? I'll just keep going spooky until I run out of things to be spooky about. So there's going to be a, a continued spookiness, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you all so much for following, liking, subscribing, and all that jazz. And I shall see you soon for another video. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.